evening and uh, thank you chairman sir and the moderators and i also want to thank uh, bansi for inviting me and the team for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak today i shall be talking on a topic which is art and science of insulin initiation with ultra long acting basal insulin now let me tell you at the onset that i believe that in spite of many guidelines basal insulin is still under prescribed under utilized and provide prob probably less popular in general practice whereas there is no reason uh, simplicity of regimen is very important efficacy is very important managing hypoglycemia is very important so i want to thank novo nordis for supporting me for this lecture uh, but we'll be talking science now it is important to have some prelims before we uh, proceed on to the brass tacks for the topic of the evening that what is the state of the nation we know that diabetes is not only comes earlier in our country but we have got one in 18 adults have diabetes so there is 77 million people more than 57% of people with diabetes are undiagnosed i think this area is very worrisome because considering the potential of micro and macrovascular complication and considering the cost implication health implication and also the psychological implication of the patient if we have got 44 million people who are not diagnosed with diabetes that would be a very sorry state of affair in this century and this time all these population that are relatively earlier type 2 onset higher insulin resistance greater insulin secretory defect therefore the bottom line is we need to be more proactive in identifying now how much have we done if you look at the type study what is basically is interesting because they look at 55000 patients and to see that how many or what percentage of patient had age beyond c of less than 7% now in spite of all the modern medicine that we have the progress in insulin the fact that we have got so many newer anti diabetic drugs on board it is surprising that only 22% of the people have age beyond less than 7% i think there is a very sad state of affair so if you have got 22% only good control that makes you almost 76 to 78% and in the study it was around 70 uh, so is about 24% was within number to be precise 23.4 so therefore this huge number of patients are at risk of complication therefore it also begs for better answer from our side in terms of control delay in insulin initiation only 31% people with diabetes are being managed with insulin now i would take your point that initially that may be quite justified but what is worrisome is that when time has arrived then also we are delaying insulin initiation i think one of the reason for the delay probably is that not only the patient barriers but also the clinician barrier the moment you think of insulin i think it's more time you have to give to the patient you also worry about hypoglycemia you worry about targets you worry about smdg but i think that this is on us lies on us that we must initiate insulin early and if we can keep the regimen simple then i think it will be more useful like starting a basal typical therapeutic progression we all know we start with lifestyle and oids then you start with basal insulin plus oig then titrate the dose then basal and then go to premex and of course you go up the ladder today you have got an insulin pump as well but in type 2 diabetes i think because we have got a residual insulin left in the body a basal insulin makes sense so if you are having i'm not saying that there is no place for premex what i am trying to say is that to initiate and for a good many years simplicity of regimen simplicity of injection simplicity of titration simplicity of monitoring lies with the basal insulin therefore it is very important that we follow this and we have got enough evidence now to say that if we start with the basal early on instead of delay then we will be able to keep our patient better in terms of complication 
I mean prevention of complication. Unlike insulin addition of subsequent OAD, we know that after three OADs, you know that here the benefit of when you use the fourth, there will be exception. But by and large, we know that the fourth OAD doesn't help. If you look at the post-treatment, the pre-treatment. So when you use the fourth OAD, remember that chances that you will get them a better target or a better control is very less. But if you use the insulin, then you can see minus 1.3% reduction in AUMC. I think this is a very important uh, message to give that what happens is when you are on the maximum of OHA, then patient wants to buy time and probably we also want to buy time. I think to be proactive at that stage without being reactive is very important. It is also important to use a simple once daily insulin like a basal along with an intelligent combination of OADs and that will give us our targets. Successive OADs provide lessening effect that we have seen in the study, substantial benefit from initiating insulin. So once the barrier is broken, once you start insulin, even a basal, I think the patient also understands the benefit. And if you look at recommendations, then today, standing on 21st century, you know very well that HB1C above target, despite dual or triple therapy, consider GLP-1 RA initially, but insulin as a first injectable after GLP-1, of course, especially when HB1C is more than 10%. But of course, there is one caveat I want to put. If somebody has come with a new diagnosis of diabetes, remember the duration of diabetes is also very important when you are trying to argue for initiation of insulin. But however, as a general rule, if somebody's age beyond is 10%, more importantly, if the patient is symptomatic and there's catabolism exists, then you should, in terms of weight loss, polyuria, polydipsia, we should start insulin. Insulin therapy should be considered in all patients failing to achieve glycemic tar target on three oral agents. There are also a lot of evidence and papers to show that if you start insulin early on in the diabetes, probably in the first two years, then probably you can also prevent beta cell going down the line of apoptosis, but rather the de-differentiation and re-differentiation. And probably you can, uh, there are studies to see that the patient can actually get back to remain partial remission, if not complete remission. So therefore it is very important to start insulin in an appropriate patient. If the patient age is less than 8%, then of course, uh, Although 10 is a thumb rule, if you are starting somebody in a basal, I think 10 units is a thumb rule. And then, of course, there are many guidelines in terms of units per kg, but then you can always titrate and optimize the dose. RSSDI recommends insulin after three OADs. So recommendation, that makes sense also. I sh showed you the previous study where it says that adding the fourth, barring exception, should be a case for an insulin. And I always should advise that a basal is probably a good choice. But it is interesting to talk when we are talking of this, that if you, I get a lot of patients like rice dominating, rice eating states like Assam, Bengal, Risa, and many, many parts of the probably central India also. But I got patients from Mizoram and Northeast who take two major meals, one in the morning and one in the evening. Well, actually, again, there is a challenge in trying to understand how to optimize your drugs. But still, giving a basal once daily is a very good uh, way to start. Providers should be using insulin. So, sometimes uh, it, it is not a threat. Sometimes, you know, insulin is looked upon as a threat. I think that is a wrong way of communication. And of course, uh, OADs have been, because newer OADs are available, it is possible to combine them very effectively. And though there are several new oral agents available, their glucose lowering potential is relatively less when compared with insulin. And hence, insulin should never be delayed if HB1C remains high. So there is no compromise on HB1C. That's what uh, one point I would like to start. So when to start insulin? Well, all of us agree. My simple one-liner is that if the patient's blood sugar is not under control, not under the target, as the individualized target of the patient start insulin. If the age balance is more than seven, with the maximum uh, tolerated dose of the OHA that you have planned and started, start insulin. So if the hyperglycemia persists, start insulin. 
If there is uh, symptoms of catabolism, you need insulin. But most RSSJ also says that individuals with symptomatic hypoglycemia and metabolic decompensation should receive an initial antihypoglycemic regimen containing it with or without metformin. So insulin is important. Now we are very familiar with this, that when you are trying to ADAESD guidelines of 2020, that if you have got an atherosclerotic CVD, you know you go to the GLP-1, SGLT-2 inhibitor, and then of course, uh, you have to think that whether the blood sugar is under control or not. And then, of course, some might benefit from, some might be added a uh, SU, but insulin or basal would do very good if the blood sugar is not under control. If you are thinking of hypoglycemia as a concern, then again, now there's a paradigm shift with the coming of incretine based therapy and SDLT2 inhibitors and metformin. We know very well that you can pitch them on before you go to um, insulin. So if the blood sugar is still not under control, start a basin. Weight concern, again, a GLP-1, SGLT-2 with metformin. And then, of course, if the blood sugar is not under control, either SUs or uh, insulin. Cost is an issue. SU and TZD goes up very much that we all know. But if not controlled, insulin. So insulin is the treatment. The various basal insulins, as we know, are Detimir, NPH was the earlier. We are using less insulin. Glargin U300 has come up now, insulin Detimir, insulin Glargin U100, and insulin Deglure. I think um, these insulins are important because factors with newer insulins have given us a lot of convenience, efficacy, and less hypoglycemia, less glycemic variability. So efficacy, hypoglycemia, glycemic variability, and simplicity is something that we look at. And if you look at the studies, then you know that if you look at any of the conclude, devote, begin Asia, begin, begin study, begin once long, in all the studies, you can see that ultra long acting does the maximum age balance reduction. Important is to take care of the hypoglycemia. Therefore, if you look at the studies of hypoglycemia across our cities, you know the begin study. Um, <clears throat> there are, there are uh, many studies uh, th that have shown the benefit of if you look at the begin study, which is again uh, almost they they showed the nocturnal hypoglycemia was less. These are actually uh, you are trying to do degludec versus glargine u uh, hundred. So uh, lanta. So if you see that it is a hands down win for degludec. If you look at switch two again, then compared with uh, glargine u hundred, and they switched each other to see what is the benefit. Again, you know, the hypoglycemia benefit was with the degludec. If you look at the devote, which I was a part of devote, and if you look at the cardiovascular outcome, it was non-inferior to uh, glargine U100. But if you look at the severe hypoglycemia, that was less with degludec. If you look at the real world study of the European treat, they looked at the retrospective analysis they did of the patient, and they found, again, hypoglycemia was less with degludec. So hypoglycemia across RCTs, and you can see here that IDEG versus Glargine U300. Again, here also overall symptomatic was slightly in favor of uh, Delude, nocturnal hypoglycemia and severe hypoglycemia. I think that ultra long acting uh, insulin is important because whenever you try to attend a very tight control, the chances of hypoglycemia also increases. But if you look at Deglude, then what, what it does, it keeps things in range. So time in range is also very good. There is less glycemic variability. They remain in the range, but still they don't cause hypoglycemia. So in spite of trying to attempt uh, better control of diabetes, there is less glycemic variability and less hypoglycemia. Lower day-to-day -day variability of Deglude versus uh, basal analog. Therefore, again, you, you can see the benefit when you come to the degludec, even with glargine 300. So therefore, it is important to know that day-to-day -day variability, we talk of time in range, we do short term and long term. So now we can again see that degludec is better in terms of day-to-day -day variability, significantly lower glycemic variability with degludec. That's why these newer regimens or newer insulins like ultra long acting degludec is slowly occupying a very important position in our day-to-day -day practice. 
and better time in range and less time below range. I think this is probably very important, as important as this. So time below range with IDEC versus IGLAR-U100, again, you can see the nocturnal level one, level two, even the estimated treatment difference is significant 1.3% in favor of Deglurid over GLARG-100. So time in range, time below range in both Deglurid had a better um, result. So simple initiation, titration of Deglutec in type two. Again, I said that you should start with the thumb rule of 10 unit, and then you can, of course, in three to five days, and then adjust the dose, making your target something around, uh, it depends upon the individual, but even if you keep it 80 to 120, that would be a nice way to do. Flexible dosing is very important with this, ultra long acting, but you can use it any time of the day, but it's, it's recommended that you should use it in a fixed time. Uh, and then that would be beneficial. I hope I have kept the time and thank you very much.